Hello, everybody. In this tutorial, we're using Abacus to perform a steady state stress analysis of the classic plate with a hole test case. So if you open Abacus, I'm just making a new um, standard explicit model. Um, as always, we'll set the working directory first if it's not already set. So I set my uh, this Abacus models in my documents. And then I'm going to save this model database. I could be just using one model database for all my models uh, that are related, uh, but in this case, I'm going to keep them separate. I'm going to call it plate to hole or steady state to hole. And I'm going to rename this to steady state plate to hole, my model. Um, and now I can just follow through the same steps as I've done in the previous models and as we'll do in other software. So a geometry and mesh, material properties, and uh, boundary conditions or loading conditions. So right click or double click on part, right click and then click on create. It's gonna be a 2D model. I'm just gonna call it plate hole and leave the approximate size. So there's a variety of different ways as with any CAD package for drawing slightly more complex geometry. I could just draw a square plate and cut a circle out of it. Uh, but here I'm just gonna use the lines and arcs to achieve this. So I'm going to use this uh, center arc, so center and two endpoints. Uh, so first I give a center point. So I can either click at the origin or I will, you can see the coordinates are given up here as I'm moving around, or I'll type it in. So I'm gonna type in zero comma zero. And for the first point then, um, or the top point up here, I'm gonna type in zero comma 0 0.5. It's the top of the hole. And then the second uh, point, it's going to be a 0 0.5 comma zero. I'm just going to use scroll to, to zoom in a little bit. So just scroll on the mouse to zoom in. <coughs> so this problem is it's a full plate uh, or, or a four by four meter plate with a um, one meter diameter hole in the center of uh, But due to symmetry, we're, we're only going to model one quarter of the plate. So the top right corner of it. So we're, the plate you can imagine will be this size here with a hole here, uh, but we're only going to model this section of the plate. So I'm going to change the straight lines. So I'm going to attach to this point here. And then for the next point, it's going to be at two comma zero. So that brings it to there. Then the top corner point is going to be two comma two. Then across to here is zero comma two. And then I can just click to connect it there. Now I press escape on the keyboard just to um, end the line selection here. I click this red button here, it'll auto fit to view. So this is one quarter of the plate we're going to model. So um, when there's symmetry conditions, we can take advantage of the fact that we know what the solution will look like or attributes of the solution along the symmetry plane. So there's special symmetry conditions. So Abacus is not modeling the full plate for us. Um, um, it just we since we know mathematically what's going to happen to the solution field and the symmetry planes, we can use these special symmetry conditions. And um, so we're going to talk about that in some other slides. So I can just middle click the same done now, or I can just click done down here. So that's my part made. So let's make the mesh. So open up my parts and double click on mesh or go to the meshing module. And let's seed it to set the element size. And it's okay. Maybe I'll, I'll half that, just make it a bit smaller. So 0.1 and press apply and okay. And mesh it, press yes. So you can see this is the particular mesh approach it adopted. So the color pink here that we saw before we mesh that represents um, what type or shape of meshing method it's going, it's going to use. So if we click on this here, you can see pink here corresponds to free for quad dominated. So if we said quad structured and apply and yes, delete, it makes it green. So that means it's going to try and make a structured mesh. So we can just see what it looked like if it does a good job. So you can see it actually that is uh, Quite a nice mesh. And by a nice mesh, I mean the best meshes are perfect squares or perfect triangles or in 3D perfect um, cubes and perfect tetrahedron. So um, let's let's go with this meshing approach. You look at the element controls, it's gonna be plain stress, linear elements, and um, that's fine. Some of these settings down here reduced integration. We're going to talk about that as well. That's to do with the Gaussian integration, how the stresses are calculated in each element. So that's our mesh created. Um, Let's uh, make our material now. So if we double click on materials, we're gonna use steel again. It's gonna be a elastic um, problem, a 
hooky and linear elastic problem. So we just need two mechanical properties for steady state. So we need Young's modulus, so we'll set to 200 gigapascals and Poisson's ratio 0.3. So you can just press tab on your keyboard if you want to jump between the boxes as well. Now we have to assign that to the part. So double click on sections, steel section, like a steel. And then we'll double click on section assignments for part, select all of our plate. So we're gonna type in all to give a, a name to, um, to a set for all of it. Click done and select steel section and press okay. So in this way, for example, let's say we had a plate where part of the plate was reinforced with aluminium and then the rest of steel, and you'd be able to select one part of it and set it to one material and the other part and set it to another material. And if you wanted to split this plate, um, we'll talk about that later as well. You can use something called partitioning um, where you can you know, split this geometry with lines of the different parts. So that's the material assigned. Um, Previously, when we applied boundary conditions, we just selected them. And um, when we when we had to make the boundary conditions, we just selected the edges. But in this tutorial, let's just make sets and surfaces that we create in the part, and then we'll just select those sets and surfaces later, just as an alternative way to do it. And um, this isn't so important for a simple problem like this, but if you imagine you have a very large, complicated problem, once again, like part of an airplane or a car, it's very difficult to select everything in the, in the viewer. So you may want to define these sets for the individual components first. So then you can just select from the list and um, later on. So you know you're applying boundary conditions in the right place. So we have sets, one called all at the moment, like double click on sets. I'm gonna make one called left, which is going to be this left boundary. Press done. Make another one called um, down, which is this one here. Press done. And I'm going to make a surface called right. And that's over here. Press button. So surfaces are just like sets. It's just you need them for applying um, like pressure or tractions or heat flux boundary conditions. Okay. Next, I'm going to add the part as an instance. So double click on instances in assembly and add the plate hole. Press OK. So remember, the analysis is only performed on the instances in the assembly. It doesn't matter what parts are created. And um, next, we're going to create the step. So it's going to be a steady state stress analysis. So static general again. If we wanted to make a transient problem, then we'd have to pick one of the models which starts with dynamic, or the steps that starts with dynamic. So dynamic implicit, dynamic explicit, and dynamic temp dis, uh, explicit. So typically, we would pick dynamic implicit or explicit. Um, which one you would pick uh, depends on the characteristics of the problem. They should both give the same answer if they work. Um, but typically, if you're looking at something happening very fast, like an impact problem, uh, explicit can be much faster. But if it's a slower uh, problem or a longer problem, then implicit tends to be faster. That's the main uh, decision that you would, a uh, 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 question you'd have to answer when you're deciding which to use. But this is going to be a steady state problem. So static general, um, we're going to leave the defaults. Later on, this NL geomas may become important. So nonlinear geometry. And so it's set to off by default, which makes simplifications for the underlying equations. Um, so that's fine now. We're going to set our boundary conditions. Um, so we will go BC. So we're going to set a symmetry condition there, symmetry condition here, and then apply attraction pulling the leg to the right. So go symmetry on the left. So I'll call it left. And um, rather than picking in the, in the viewport, we're going to go over the sets on the right here. Click on that, and then it's going to be plate one hole left. So you can see it highlights it for us. Um, and that's going to be an X sim. So to know which symmetry condition to uh, apply, because you have different types, uh, you have to look at the normal of the boundary. So if we take this line and you were to draw a, a line going perpendicular to that boundary, that would go in the minus X direction. So that means the normal direction is the minus X direction. So then you have an X symmetry. So if you look at what it's saying here, it says that U1 is zero. So on these points, these points are on a symmetry plane, then the displacement in the X direction has to be zero. So a point cannot move off a symmetry plane because then the problem is no longer symmetric. And so that would be X sim. And then similarly, if we go for the down condition, so down here, down, 
it would be y sim, so the normal would be in the y or minus y direction on this down. And that means that the u2, the y displacement, has to be zero. So points on the symmetry plane can move along the symmetry plane, but they can't move off it because then that would break the symmetry. And um, so this is what I was saying that uh, Abacus doesn't model the other part. It doesn't know anything about the fact that this is one quarter. And um, it just knows that mathematically, we can say certain things about the displacement field. And it's those conditions that uh, Abacus is enforcing. So that's symmetry there and there. And then we're going to go click on loads and we're going to apply a pressure like we did in the um, bar case. And that's going to be applied to the right hand side. Once again, it's automatically opening this region first because we had started to select from sets. If we wanted to select in the viewport, we just click down there, there and it goes back and lets us select in the viewport. And so we're going to apply minus one megapascal again, pulling in the right direction. So the classic analytical solution says if you have an infinite plate, if you apply a traction of one in the x direction here, you'll get a stress concentration of, of three just by the hook. So this plate is a little bit is smaller, it's not infinite in size, so that tends to concentrate the stress even more. So probably for this size plate, we'd expect the stress to be a bit higher than three, and three times the plate, so three megapascals. Okay, and um, the last thing we're going to do here is um, it's useful to monitor the forces often in stress analysis cases. So I want to measure the force versus time on this left boundary. So to do that, I'm going to use a history output. So if I go to history outputs, we already have a default one, but if I make a new one, double click, history output two, I'm going to change it to a set. So on the left boundary, I want to store the forces. So if I open up here, see what I'm doing. So forces, Reaction force one. So that's reaction force in the x direction. That's what I want to, to measure. So now we're ready to go. I'll save it now. Probably should have saved it before this. And um, double click on jobs for my steady state plate hole. Okay. And submit it. Let's check monitor. So it will say aborted if there is errors. And, and if there are errors, then you right click on the monitor and you, you go to errors here and you try to understand what the errors are. So you can see it's starting now. That's done the first step. It is done. So I go right click results. So you can see for of the order of hundreds of elements, you're talking about a second to solve the problem. Once you go to thousands, then you start to talk about tens of seconds to minutes. And once you go to 100,000, then I mean, it doesn't wrap up linearly, it wraps up exponentially, so it, uh, it can start to become errors then, and then you're starting to look at running on a circuit computer. So if I click this here, um, I by default, it will show the von Mies stress. So the von Mies stress is a scalar. So remember, the stress is a tensor. So there's a stress. When you say, what is the stress? Well, you have to say, well, which stress you're talking about. So there's an XX stress, YY, an XY. And if, if it's 3D, then you have all the other shears as well. Um, so often for design purposes, people will use the von Mies stress or the maximum principal stress. So the von Mies stress typically for a ductile material will tell you when permanent deformation is going to occur. So for in steel, we would often use the von Mies stress and it will tell us that when the von Mies stress gets the U strength of the material, it's probably going to start to permanently deform. So if you're designing something, you would look at the von Mies stress and compare it to the strength. So we're getting up to 200 and, um, or two megapascals here. So steels will often vary from a few hundred megapascals and to thousands of megapascals in strength. So we're probably well below the yield strength of most steels. You can also look at the maximum uh, principal stress, um, which looks similar and similar magnitude, but for brittle materials, that's often used for design purposes. Check how close that is to the strength. But once again, we're like only 3% of a very uh, low strength steel. Um, so, some of the other fields we can look at, of course, you can look at our displacement magnitude, the X and Y components of displacement. And we can also look at the strains as well. So we have the components of strain, the XX, YY, XY, ZZ, and the principal strains um, as well. So um, if we click on this common options here, from the last time I ran it, I had turned off auto compute. And to scale the deformation is just set to the true deformation. But if I turn back on auto compute for the scale deformation scale factor, you'll see that Abacus 
uh, is warping the model. So you can see how what the deformation looks like, except the deformation now is, is scaled by 20, 30,000, just, just to let you see that it's pulling it in this direction and the hole is getting squashed and elongated. So that's not the true deformation, it's just the true deformation multiplied by a scaling factor, so you can see it. And if you see anything with a little black in the right corner, you can hold left click and there's different options. So you can just display the colors on the undeformed geometry if you want it. Um, so that automatically just turns off um, the movement of the mesh entirely. So what do we want to look at? Um, we want to look at the force on the left versus time. So how do we do that? So we can go to um, XY data, double click on that, go ODB history output. So we store these forces as a history output to continue. So by default for stress analysis problems, it would store quite a lot of um, history outputs. So to do with different types of energies of the entire model. But if you scroll down, you'll see these reaction forces and um, RF1. So they're all the nodes on the left-hand side here. So the force is individually stored for each node. So we want to add them all together to get the total force. So if I click on the first one and then holding shift, click on the last one, then I can save them all as the sum of them. Alternatively, up here in the name filter, I can write star, which is a wild card, or F star, press enter. It would only select these because you can see that they uniquely have or F and shift click the bottom. Click save as, I'm going to do a sum. So I'm going to go force on left. And plot curves when we're finished, sure, press OK. Dismiss this. So I can see the force starts as time zero, zero. And then it goes down to minus two e to the six and newtons, so two mega newtons. Uh, so remember, this is a big plate; it's a two meter steel plate. And um, also, since it's a two D problem, the force is quoted in per unit depth. So it's actually for a one meter thick uh, plate as well. So if you had a thinner plate, you would scale by that. So you'd multiply by the thickness of the plate to get the force for a given thickness of the plate in two D. And you can see that was also saved here. Force on left. If I right click and go edit, you can see the actual value here. Um, and very good. So now we're just going to plot uh, the stress uh, along the line here. So we know analytically the stress should be approximately three here. So that would be the XX stress. So we're applying an XX stress on the boundary. So if we look at the XX stress here, we're applying one megapascal. So that green should be exactly one megapascal. And then it's analytically, if it was an infinite plate, it would be three. Um, so I would expect it to be a bit higher since it's a smaller plate, but it's actually a little bit lower, but that's partly due to mesh errors. So um, also in case you're wondering, if you click here, you can turn off the mesh if you want to get like a nicer picture. And um, if you click on free edges here, press apply, you can see what it looks like without the mesh. Or you can turn on uh, and off different things. So let's make a pass. So I'm going to make a new path. I have some paths existing um, from the, the previous models I was creating, but I'm going to make a new path. And I'm going to, instead of um, writing in the um, no points, I could actually pick the nodes instead. So let's just make a node list, continue, and I'll go add before. So if I just pick this node, just click on it, and then I'll click on the last one. So rather than having to type in the coordinates, I can actually just select the start and then nodes. And then middle click or press done, press OK. Now we're going to plot along that. So double click next by data, path from before. Make sure to pick this path I created, which was called path three. Do it on the undeformed, include intersections, S11, the SXX plot. So at the start, you can see it's almost three. And then it kind of smoothly drops off to one in the distance. Um, so I'm going to save that. So I'm going to call it S11 um, along path. Mesh one. So in this case, I want to see what effect the finer mesh would have. So I'm going to rerun this problem with a finer mesh. So I'm going to go back to the model tab at the top, double click on the mesh. And I'm going to click on the spacing and I'm going to half the spacing. So instead of 0 0.1, I'm going to have 0 0.05. Press apply. You'd expect to have four times as many elements now because each square is split into four. If you were in 3D, you'd have eight. So you can see uh, very quickly the number of elements uh, adds up. Mesh the part. So it's a bit finer now. Um, I don't need to change anything else now. So I can just rerun the job. If I wanted, I could make a new job. So then the results will be um, will be kept separately. I'll keep both files. Um, so maybe that's actually not a bad idea, but I'm, I'm not going to do it now. 
I'll just submit this case again. So because I didn't make a new job, it's going to overwrite the previous results. So check the monitor, be a bit slower this time. Um, I didn't see how many elements there were. One limitation when you're using the free student version of Abacus is there's only a limit of 1,000 nodes. So probably this model is already slightly above that. So you may need to increase the seed size to allow you to complete it. Um, that should be fine for all the tutorials, but if you do plan to do your mini project uh, using um, Abacus, then you, um, you may prefer to install the UCD version. Okay, so that was done, that was pretty quick. Results, and let's look at the, the stresses again. So let's look at the S11. So it's, it's gone above three now. So let's look at our path tree is still in the right place. We can just use the same path. So I go X, Y data, path, path three, include intersections, S11, plot it, looks fine. Let's save it. So I go S11 along path mesh two. So this was our final mesh. Now if you see we've S11, we've mesh one here, double click, mesh two here. So let's put them both in the same plots. So you can either shift click or hold in control uh, to click ones on and off, or and and then double click to plot both of them, or you can just double click on one and then right click on the second one and go add to plot. So if you see here, um, which ones, uh, which I think our coarser mesh was the, the red one, and the finer mesh is the, the blue one. So you can see where the solution is not changing so much, the mesh was already fine enough. But it's when the fields are changing quite quickly from element to element, that's where the larger mesh errors occur. So that's where a finer mesh is. Uh, there is also more sensitive to the element size. So you can see there's starting to be a difference here, but then the largest difference is right at the edge of the hole because there was the great this gradient in stress. And you can also see the size of the elements here. So you can see there's like a straight line there and there, whereas for red one, it's a bigger straight line because they're bigger elements. Um, so if we refine it again, eventually, as we refine it, we'd expect the results to stop changing. And then we've reached a mesh independent uh, solution. So it depends on what you're interested in. If you're only interested in stress here, the uh, coarse mesh is fine. But if you're interested here, you might need a, a finer mesh. Um, and I'm going to stop the tutorial there.